Hi, my name is Mike Duran. I'm a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute, and this is an event on Saudi Arabia uh, and the new Middle East. There have been an enormous number of significant, um, significant events uh, in recent weeks, events that uh, I believe are changing the balance of power in the, in the region. Uh, and we've invited uh, two um, extremely experienced and knowledgeable guests to discuss these uh, changes with us. On my right is uh, Professor Bernie Haeckel from the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Uh, he's an expert on the Middle East in general and uh, uh, has a special expertise on, uh, on, uh, on Yemen. Welcome, Bernie. Uh, and on my left is Mohammed Al-Yakya. This is his inaugural event as a visiting fellow here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, Mohammed is uh, formerly the uh, English language editor of Al Arabiya, um, and uh, uh, he is uh, a Saudi national, um, and uh, he is uh, also a very astute student of the Middle East. And uh, Mohammed, since this is a an event on Saudi Arabia, perhaps I'll start with you. Um, and let me just ask you, you know, one of the one of the most uh, striking things that's happened the last few weeks is the restart uh, of the negotiations in Vienna on the, uh, on the JCPOA. Um, why don't you give us a sense of um, how Riyadh is reading the, the negotiations? <coughs> thanks, thanks, Mike. I think um, uh, the apprehensions that uh, uh, not only Riyadh but other Gulf states have this time around are the same as they had in, in, in 2015. Uh, albeit maybe you know uh, a little sharper, uh, because because uh, the region really witnessed what an empowered Iran looked like for the region in Iraq and, and Syria, and Lebanon and in Yemen. Uh, we did see that uh, you know uh, the GCC did uh, endorse a document or put forth a document where they supported the idea of uh, uh, reaching a new deal with Iran. But that, again, is a parallel to what happened in 2015. You know, there was a feeling in the region, and in the Gulf in particular, that um, uh, the, those countries were left out of a security agreement that touches their own national security uh, very closely. Uh, you know, the so that the, the United States is negotiating with the Iranians over the head of its regional allies. Precisely. So, so the idea is that you know, the Iranian threat is, is multifaceted. Uh, it's a nuclear threat, that's for sure, but also ballistic missiles are a threat. Um, uh, militias uh, across the region and proxies that Iran has are, are also a threat. Uh, and none of the countries that are within range of Iran's ballistic missiles were, were included in an agreement that, uh, you know, flushed the regime with cash and allowed it to, to rapidly expand its proxy network uh, across the region. So today we're seeing the same thing. And it's important to note that, uh, you know, for many of these countries, the United States is a very valuable ally. If the United States wants you on board publicly with any of its initiatives, uh, you, you, you publicly endorse that initiative. That doesn't really change that, uh, you know, there, there is real worry and there is real apprehension in private. And I'm sure that officials in the Gulf are making that worry very clear and communicating that to the administration today, just as they did in, in 2015. So you, you're, you are, uh, I mean, I, I think for somebody like me, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, which is that, the, that the, uh, the effort to find a deal with Iran is actually empowering Iran. But of, co of course, a lot of people are presenting this as, as it's actually constraining Iran in some way. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the view in the region, I think, is that it, it is empowering Iran. And I think, in fact, it did, it did uh, empower Iran, uh, you know. And, and empowering Iran across the board, course, not just in the nuclear. See, the thing is, you know, there's a very popular uh, uh, diagnosis of, of, of the region in which, you know, uh, uh, Iranian expansion in the region is painted as a sort of, uh, you know, cost-effective, efficient, uh, cheap expansion across the region, whereas, you know, the multi-billion dollar defense budgets of Gulf countries are, are uh, you know, cost much more. The reality is there are over 100 Shia militias uh, in the region that are funded, cultivated, supported by Iran, and that adds up. And Iran needs U.S. dollars in order to uh, maintain uh, those militias. Um, and and uh, sanctions deprive the regime of those U.S. dollars that it needed. So that's why in the past few years, 
We saw, for example, Hezbollah call on the party faithful to, to donate to them. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, in addition, of course, to the elimination of Qasem Soleimani, the fact that there wasn't much money around caused a lot of discord within uh, the ranks of Iraqi militias. Uh, there was suffering in Syria uh, in that regard, and, and to some extent in Yemen as well. Uh, so I think the view in the region is that if, if uh, the JCPOA were to be um, uh, uh, brought back as it was, first of all, the sunset clauses are just around the corner, so, so it's, it's a clear path to give Iran a nuclear weapon. Uh, it's kicking the can down the road, but, but you know, I think more importantly, four countries in the region um, it, it, it means that uh, the Revolutionary Guards will be empowered to, to go on overdrive uh, and, and uh, you know, reestablish that hold over their proxies that was diminished to a large degree by, by the elimination of Qasem Soleimani. So, so you mentioned this, this uh, GCC statement in support of the nuclear deal. If, if, if what you're saying is true, if this is causing alarm in, in, in Riyadh, uh, and I have no doubt I, that you're... That it, that it is, but wh why isn't uh, why isn't Mohammed bin Salman standing up and screaming it from the rooftops that this is a, um, that this is a, a betrayal by the United States of its allies that it, they're empowering the worst elements in the in the Middle East? Because this is this is uh, the second rodeo. I mean, this this happened under the Obama administration. So I think there's a perception uh, in the region and and in, in fact here in Washington among a lot of people that uh, that follow this stuff that uh, this realignment uh, away from traditional allies in the region, this reimagining of what the American security order in the Middle East looks like uh, is, is underway. So, so uh, what, what several Gulf countries and several Arab countries are doing is trying to hedge their bets. They're trying to deal with that reality on the ground. And uh, you know, if, if, if this was the first time, then maybe you'd see more uh, you know, public uh, denouncement, but it's 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 like a movie that you've seen again. Mm -hmm. You know, you know exactly how it's going to play out. You know where uh, uh, you know the, the 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 supporters of that sort of policy will not budge. Uh, so they know ahead of time that they get, they're not going to get a hearing in Washington, and if they raise their voice, they're just going to annoy Washington. So they just deal with the reality that's created without really trying to fight it. Yeah, in Washington, I'm, I'm, I think that's a fair characterization, and then also, I mean. Uh, this has been made clear by the Biden administration that the strategic priority, as they see it for the United States, is uh, to shift focus a little bit away from the Middle East in order to counter the China threat. Um, mm. Which that, that's another. We'll get, yeah, we'll, another we'll get, I'll, 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 I'll come back to you on China in a, in a little bit. But uh, Professor Haeckel, uh, uh, Mohammed is saying that there's a, uh, a realignment. With Iran, not just not just with regard to the JCPOA, but across the the, the region. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what that means in Yemen. First of all, do you see it that way yourself? And then, and and what does it mean uh, in Yemen, where there's a there's an Iranian proxy, the Houthis, who are uh, operating against the Saudis? Yeah. So I, I definitely do see that um, the signals, and and those signals go back um, well over a decade now that the US is reorienting its, itself and that um, traditional allies are not the key levers for American influence in the region. And what Mohammed said, which is that the actors in the region are hedging. So in the case of a country like Saudi Arabia, but also the UAE and others, what hedging means is, is to think differently or to begin to think differently about China. What, what can China's role be in the region? And as you know, the Chinese are already present in Djibouti. They, they help with um, maintaining security against Djibouti, piracy. which is 25 miles from the Yemen coast. That's so, right, on so the other side of the horn. We, we, yeah. Technically, an, a base in, in, in Africa, yes. but in but the very, Middle East. Yeah, very much in the Middle East. Um, I think there is, um, you know, the, the Russians are present and the Russians have shown themselves to be effective both in Syria and to some extent in Libya with the Wagner group, with the Wagner group. So I, I, I and, and the other the other element for Saudi Arabia in particular, um, and in other GCC countries is is oil, is how they think about the production of oil. That's a complicated set of 
issues, it's not just about politics. It has kind of economic and, and, and developmental and diversification dimensions to it. But the Saudis, for instance, when asked by the Biden administration to increase production recently, did not do so. Um, um, so I, I think that's part of, you know, one of, one of the elements of the unraveling, if you like, of, of the relationship or of the hedging that you see. Now, with respect to Yemen, what we have... Sorry, just to, yeah. just to, just to make sure that I'm clear. That one, one of the elements of the unraveling is that the, the Saudis are no longer cooperating with the Americans with regard to, to oil prices, whereas traditionally that was an area where we had a lot of, uh, a lot of give and take. Is that... Yeah, I mean, basically what happened, to be quite specific, um, the, the, for, for a couple of reasons. One, because of um, you know, the global economy was now coming back, uh, after, you know, despite COVID, and also because of the various Western and American policies on limiting exploration development in the United States, um, prices of oil were rising. And so the Americans asked the Saudis to increase production, um, very bluntly asked them to bring the price of oil down. It's a global commodity and it's fungible and it's priced globally. And the Saudis said, no, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. Now, most recently, which is literally yesterday, um, the Saudis did agree to increase production by 400,000 barrels, which was something that was already pre-agreed to with what is called OPEC Plus. That's a, a new, again, another feature of the changing global order is that the Saudis are now coordinating with the Russians on oil production. That was something that was not the case before. So, you know, there, there are all these little signs that, you know, are, you know for me, are a clear vector that, uh, of American, of the decline in American influence, uh, globally, but in particular in the region. And I'm not sure how having a deal with Iran can somehow fix that, right? In fact, it seems to me that it would accelerate the decline of American influence. Now. Should I turn to Yemen? Yeah, but as long as we're, uh, I, I do want to get to Yemen, but as long as we're on, the, on this subject, uh, since you raised this question of decline of American influence, are you, are, are, are you, do you see this as a sort of inevitable structural change, or is, uh, as uh, Charles Krauthammer famously wrote a few years ago, decline is a choice? Is this a choice that the United States has made um, uh, to, to uh, relinquish elements of the, um, of the Middle Eastern system to others, or is this just something that they can't, uh, that there's no choice no, about? I mean, in, in, it is a choice, and it's also a choice that is um, premised on a couple of very faulty assumptions. So, uh, so uh, uh, the American administration now is obsessively focused on China as the new enemy and that we have a new Cold War, and that somehow the Middle East is a distraction for, in that Cold War. So here's the faulty premise. If you really want to have China over a barrel, forgive the pun, you actually need to have control over Middle East maritime shipping and oil flows. Some, 60%, cannot, some 60% of China's uh, right. uh, energy consumption is from imported is, sources, which either originate in or transit through the, the, the Middle East. Correct. So as long as we're the dominant power there, we have them over a barrel. Exactly. Right. So I don't see how uh, diminishing your footprint in the Middle East or signaling that you're not interested in the Middle East, which is a, actually what, what is being signaled, helps you confront China. It has the opposite effect, and it, in fact, brings China into the Middle East, which is what you don't want to have happen. How does it bring China into the Middle East? Well, the, the hedging that Mohammed was saying, the, the local actors will start saying, okay, in Yemen, for instance, we're having problems potentially with maritime shipping through the Bab al-Mandeb, which is the strait at the bottom of the Red Sea that goes up to Suez and then to the Mediterranean. So if you... So the corridor but through which oil is either coming out of the Middle East and going to right. Europe or... or and 15% of all global trade goes through that strait. And you, if you remember when that one big container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, we felt it, mm -hmm. right? So maintaining security and safety uh, and the free flow of shipping through that strait is extremely important. Now, if the, if, if the Houthis say, 
take over Yemen and decide that they're going to... 25 miles from the Djibouti base. Of exactly. The what will the Saudis say? The Saudis will no doubt say to the Chinese, but also to the Europeans and the Russians and others, you know, we need you to help us keep this place secure. That's not a role that they've, any of them have ever had. That has been always an American priority and privilege. And that is why, you know, the United States has a security umbrella in the region. So we're seeing that unraveling. And you think it's no accident that the Chinese put a base in Djibouti, which is on the Bab al Straits? Absolutely. They're, they're thinking in this direction. Absolutely. They don't have the military forces at this point in time to, That's right. to, to actually be the major guarantor, but they're looking forward to a time when they could be there. And they're looking forward also, when it comes to China, their view of shipping and trade is very different from the American one. So America wants, you know, the free flow of goods, the capitalist system of, of, of um, commerce, which is that America doesn't care where the oil goes to, as long as it's going and it's being sold and it's being traded freely, right? The Chinese have a very different attitude when it comes to commodities, whether from Africa or the Middle East. They want to capture them in what is called a mer mercantilist form of, of, of trade, namely to bring them to China, not to have them flow to other countries. So it's a radically different idea of how trade flows in the world if the Chinese get control of it. Let me, uh, I do want to get back to you on Yemen in particular, but, 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 but let me get, give uh, uh, Mohammed an opportunity to come in on this. Sure. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have any reactions to, to what uh, no, I, I, Bernie's I, been saying. I think Bernie hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, you know, uh, with the current administration, the idea is to free up resources uh, from the Middle East in order to counter China and in order to compete with China. And I think the idea in China is to allocate more resources to the Middle East in order to compete with the United States. So, so these are two ideas that, that, that are um, at odds with each other. Um, and also, if, if, if you look at the idea of sharing the region, of sharing the region with Iran, of finding this sort of equilibrium where Iran is no longer feeling threatened, that uh, it comes out from the cold, what you'll have is a situation where, uh, and, and, and if the United States does you know, take its withdrawal, quote unquote, from the region to another level, you will need a security guarantor in the region. And this is not something probably that will happen in the next four years or the next eight years, but this is something, uh, that's, this is the natural progression to the idea that, that the region needs to be left alone and that the US-led security order in the region uh, is a project that's not, no longer worth pursuing. Uh, what will happen is, I think, um, is that the Chinese will, will take advantage of this. And they'll take advantage of this. And, and also Saudi Arabia will take advantage of it and Iran will take advantage of it. At the end of the day, you know, uh, China is, is Saudi Arabia's largest trade partner uh, and the largest buyer of, of uh, Saudi oil. Uh, that gives Saudi Arabia leverage over China and that gives also China leverage over Saudi Arabia and other states in the Middle East. Uh, but what, what changes the equation is the amount of leverage that China has over Iran. And that is leverage that the United States doesn't have. Uh, China is the largest buyer of, of Iranian oil and the largest trade partner of Iran. So, and of so course, they recently signed a 25-year uh, uh, 25-year uh, agreement right. by which they'll trade uh, Iranian oil for uh, for Chinese investment and uh, as well as support for uh, security and the security and intelligence right. sector in, right. in, in Iran. Right. So, so if we look at analysis of the Yemen war here in, in Washington since it began, you know, there's a lot of virtue signaling. There's a lot of, of, of focus on, on uh, um, uh, you know, various aspects of the war. But, but you know, markedly absent is, is the importance of bubble mandib that, that uh, Bernie mentioned. And I don't think that uh, this is absent in the analysis for the Chinese. You know, the idea that uh, there would be a hostile power on bubble mandib controlling the free flow of oil uh, in the Strait of Hormuz and in Babel Mandib is a problematic idea. I mean, they, they, they need uh, energy to continue flowing freely. So, so if there were to be some, some grand regional bargain, I think uh, in the long term at least, or the medium to long term, the only guarantor of that bargain, and the only, only uh, uh, actor with skin in the game that wants it to succeed would be China. Okay, so the picture you see uh, that, that, that you're putting in front of us is China working with Iran, which is backing the Houthis in, 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 in Yemen to create a situation where 
I mean, you're almost presenting, you, I'm putting words in your mouth now, you didn't say this, but you're almost presenting the Houthis as, an, as, a, as a proxy of the Chinese. Or sort of, you don't want to go that far. But, 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 you're, but, but you're, saying that you're saying, if you're sitting in Beijing and you're looking at this picture, you like what you see with the Houthis. That's I, not causing you I, any... I, I actually wouldn't go that far. I don't, I don't, think, the, the, I don't think the Chinese care who's in Yemen. I think they, they care that Bab al is, is uh, you know, a choke point that is never choked. And the same with, with Hormuz. You know, that's a point of disagreement they would have with Iran. I mean, when we're, just, we're, we're talking about the Houthis, essentially what we're talking about is Iran. Iran calls the shots when it comes to strategic decisions like that. Okay, let me push a little bit, because I, I, because I, I did hear something in there, and I, I'm a, I, but I, I knew you didn't want to go as far as to say that they're a proxy, but perhaps it warms the Chinese heart that the, that the element, that the, the, the most um, aggressive element today in Yemen is anti-American. Is that possible? I, mean, uh, I, I, I don't think this is raising alarm bells in Beijing. If that's, uh, it's not, it's I mean, not, they're, not, they're not, they're not super upset not, that not, an anti-American force is not, in Yemen. It's not, it's not disturbing them. How, no. what, what, is, what is your view on that? How are they reading it, you think? Well, I mean, I'm not an expert on China, so I, I, I really don't know how. I mean, that never I, stops us here. Yeah. You know, well, we don't. Mean, we have no respect for expertise. So. <laughs> so, no. I mean, I think Yemen is is uh, Yemen is is an interesting case because it's it's a very telling case about how Iran operates in the region, right? Namely, you get non-state actors to do your bidding, you hollow out state institutions. And then you pretend that you want these institutions to, to remain, but you, you have a veto power over their functioning. So this is what Hezbollah does, for instance, in Lebanon. This is what a number of Shiite militias can do in Iraq. Um, now, in the case of Yemen, which is a very complicated case, you have a group of people, a minority, that historically was persecuted and discriminated against, that has come to power and has created a militia using a form of an ideology that is partly inspired by the Iranian revolution and that uh, has an endless reservoir of young men that it's willing to throw into battle to e effectively take over the country, or at least the northern part of the country. So what we're seeing recently, for instance, in this war to take over an important city called Ma'rib in Yemen is that the Houthis are using human waves the, of young the, men. The, the, war for, the, the, the war for Marib is going on right now. Right now. And, and the strategic significance of it is? So it's the it's, it, two, two, two or three. First, it's the last big city that is not under uh, Houthi control. It's next to the oil fields and gas fields, the, the one remaining refinery in Yemen that functions. And it's very close to the Saudi border. OK? So if the Houthis take over Ma'rib, which looks very much like that will happen, the only thing that's stopping them is coalition air power, namely Saudi air power. Um, if they take over Ma'rib, then they control all of northern Yemen and will then effectively be the most powerful dominant force in the country. Um, now, the, the, the Houthis, um, are clearly in an alliance with the Iranians. The Iranians have helped them tremendously in, in any number of ways, through Hezbollah, with training. Many of Houthis have gone to Iran and, and, and been trained, especially on missiles and drones. Uh, they've been taught how to build their own drones. Um, their media operation is run out of the southern suburb in Beirut, which is Hezbollah territory. Um, they, they have really become a very formidable power and, um, and a very difficult one to dislodge. I'm frankly not clear as to how, you know, what the solution is to them. I think one has to accommodate them at some level, but not allow them to be, but not allow them. I sense the possibility of a, for, for some, for some yeah, disagreement. But not, but not allow them, for instance, to be um, a, a force that can, say, threaten Bab al -Mandab. And I'm not sure how to do that. But, now, but their, their slogan is explicitly anti-American. Yes. Right? Anti, an, and anti-Jewish. And anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. Well. Anti yes. Right? So 
Uh, I haven't heard the Biden administration express any concern about the rise of the Houthis. All in, in, the, in, the, in the major uh, statements that I've seen, now I can't say that I've read every statement, there's, a, there's repeated concerns well, I mean, about the there... humanitarian crisis and concern about the Saudi right. role. Uh, and, That's and, right. And in fact, so the, what, the Biden so administration... What, so, so if you're in Washington, in, yeah. the, in the White House, looking at the rise yeah. of, a, uh, of, a, of a group uh, that is an Iranian proxy, created, you know, g- given its military capabilities by Iran, and that says death to America, uh, death to the Jews, death to Israel. I, um, do alarm bells go off or no? Well, the Biden administration, the first, one of the first things the Biden administration did was to delist the Houthis because under the Trump administration, they were um, listed as a terrorist organization. The Biden administration removed them from that terror designation list, thinking that it would make them more moderate and more amenable did to... Did it work? To, no, it did not. Did it, it, did it, they not? doubled down. Oh. They doubled down on oh. their... Actually, on they their, marched on Ma'rib two days later. Do That's we, right. And I don't think down. they would have... Do we, had, had do we need to make more concessions to, to moderate them? How do we do it? I don't think you can, actually. Uh. There's no, there's no uh, hope There's no of amount of, uh, of American concessions that can moderate them? No. No? In fact, uh. they double down every time. Uh-huh. They see it as weakness. So, but, but so uh, I'm assuming that, that uh, I'm going to give our, our leadership credit that they're not idiots, and they don't believe that, that, that concessions from America are going to moderate the Houthis. So how are they reading this map, then? So my, 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 so my understanding of how the Biden administration is reading the map is, is as follows. For, firstly, you have an element of domestic politics that you have to account for, namely the element in the Democratic Party that sees the main villain in the entire Middle East to be Saudi Arabia and no one else. Right? So I think that, that element in the Democratic Party has influence over the Biden administration. So that's, that's one mm. element. The, uh, the, other, the other element um, is that they actually don't care whether the Houthis take over. In fact, they think that maybe the Houthis taking over would help, you know, end the war. Uh, I, I think you'll see... It's a, true. Victory by your enemy does end the war. It's well, true. But it is ultimately, though, a civil war in Yemen. Mm-hmm. So I don't think civil war will end, uh, you know, and, and we will see even more chaos in, in Yemen, even if we were to acknowledge Houthi victory. But why, why do they not care? The, 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 so the, the, you're basically saying then that the Americans and the Chinese are reading it the same way. It doesn't matter who rules uh, Yemen. It doesn't matter that... that a, an Iranian proxy with precision-guided weaponry, increasing uh, competence in, la- in, in, in building and launching precision-guided weaponry is not a problem for the United States. I, I'm baffled as to why they, they <laughs> don't care, frankly. Yeah. I have no answer for that. Yeah. But, but, but there's a fundamental difference between what the U.S. can do uh, in that regard and what the Chinese can do. The Chinese have in their toolbox... Uh, uh, the tools that can exercise leverage over the Iranians and tell them, you know, here are red lines, Bab al-Mandib has to be protected, Um, uh, dial it down in Iraq. I mean, they're the largest buyer of of, uh, uh, Iranian oil. They're the largest trade partner with Iran. That's a lot of leverage that they can exercise over the Iranians that the United States simply does not have. Right. So that's that's where the difference lies. So uh, an American withdrawal and, uh, you know, a filling of that vacuum by Russia doesn't really matter. I mean, every, a lot of people wrote about um, Russia taking advantage of, of vacuums left by the Americans, but these are scraps, you know. Uh, um, and again, you know, uh, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that the U.S. security order is going to dis- disappear overnight. Mm. Uh, I'm just taking what we're hearing uh, uh, from, from this sort of Obama doctrine to its logical extreme. And if you do take it to that logical extreme. Obama doctrine being? Being the idea that, uh, you know, pivoting towards Asia, pivoting away from the region, allowing, uh, you know, these warring parties that have irrationally fought each other for 1,400 years in the region to just figure their stuff out. Um, You know, looking at the United States as a removed and isolated third party, a neutral arbiter to some irrational struggle between the Shias in Iran and the Sunnis in, in Saudi Arabia. And it's yeah. a problematic idea for many reasons. First of all, the struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran is not because uh, of sectarianism. Sectarianism is a tool that is used. 
uh, in that struggle. Uh, the reality of the matter is Iran opposes Saudi Arabia because it views Saudi Arabia as an agent of this American imperial order. Um, and I've, I've done several track tours with the Iranians, almost 12. Uh, and, I, and with one senior Iranian official, I, I, I actually you know, pose this idea that if Saudi Arabia were to break ties with the United States, there wouldn't be a problem with Iran anymore. And our Western interlocutors in the room started laughing and saying, well, what do you mean? Of course, there will be a struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And he, he raised his hand and he said, no, no, Mohammed is absolutely correct. You know, the only problem we have is that, uh, you know, uh, 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 these Gulf states are, are agents of, of, of this U.S. order in the Middle East that is supportive of Israel, uh, that is threatening uh, Iran. So, so the problem is essentially one way between this idea of a U.S. order in the Middle East and uh, Iran's vision for that order. What Iran strives to do in the region is upend what it perceives to be a U.S. regional, a US regional order, not a Saudi regional order. But so, so from the point of view of Riyadh, just help us understand a little bit about what, what does a Houthi victory in, uh, in Yemen, uh, what are the implications for, for Saudi Arabia? So there are multiple implications. I mean... Uh, Sorry, just because uh, the, the administration has made a case from the moment it came into power. It, it has made a case uh, uh, that... Saudi Arabia is the cause of the conflict in Yemen, or the Saudi actions are the problematic aspect of the war from the American point of view. Um, and the, the Saudis should just pull back. I don't know that they've ever said it exactly, but the implication of their statements is Saudi Arabia should just, should just pull out of the war, in the war, and then we can all, uh, uh, the, 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 then we can all uh, uh, sleep a little bit more soundly at, uh, at night. So let's, let's just, uh, for the sake of discussion, let's just say that the Saudis listen to that and say, okay, we're pulling out. What, what are the implications for Saudi Arabia then? And, and, and as, as Professor Haeckel said, the Houthis basically go and win in the sense of take the north, right, all the north. So, so I think it's worth noting that uh, the cooperation between the United States and Saudi Arabia today in Yemen uh, is probably unprecedented. They are on the same page. Um, and, and the number of sorties that you see the Arab coalition, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, doing in Yemen has, uh, you know, dropped dramatically. There were some attacks on IRGC facilities, actually, in, uh, near Sana'a airport uh, uh, recently. But, um, you know, the, the almost daily, uh, uh, you know, bombardment of Houthi uh, positions that we saw in past years doesn't exist anymore. So, so, so the idea that you're, you're, you're floating actually is... is uh, is what we're seeing on the ground happening in, 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 in Yemen today. But to answer your initial question, you know, what happens if, if there is a full withdrawal or what happens if, if you know, you know uh, just the Houthis are allowed to, to, to rule Yemen? Um, I mean, th there is an argument to be made to say, you know, just this is, this is uh, a future war, uh, uh, allow, allow the Houthis to... to um, uh, run Yemen and uh, allow the Iranians to control Yemen and just, just step back, this is a quagmire. Uh, but I think the problem with that uh, argument is that uh, uh, having a failed state on your border uh, is different than, than uh, you know, uh, uh, choosing to ignore or divest from or disengage with Lebanon. You know, that's one thing. But having a huge border on... Uh, a huge southern border with you're, Yemen. You're referring to the Saudi disengagement so from Lebanon. The, the Saudis recently yeah, the Saudi, disengaged from Lebanon. The and they said, the, uh, okay, yeah, we're, that, we're, 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 we're done being involved in your, in your politics. Precisely, precisely. But, but that's, some, that's a luxury I don't think that the Saudis have uh, uh, in Yemen. Um, because this is a porous border. This is the porous border. There, that, there, that, there, that, there are uh, tribes that cross the border. It, so has, that it's, it uh, has the highest number of small arms per capita in the world after the United States. Um, and and uh, you know. So that's an unsettled problem. Yemen is an, an unsettled, unsettled Saudi, an unsettled southern, Saudi, southern Saudi. An Arabia. unsettled Yemen is an unsettled Mexico for the United States. Yeah. It's, that's that's the comparison. The other point is Babel Mandeb. Uh, hormones is a huge national security uh, concern for every single Gulf state. If you were to go into a national security meeting anywhere in the Gulf, you know the security of Strait of Hormuz is is one of the, those top points. You know, imagine adding uh, the other choke point, as mm. Bernie mentioned. You know. Uh, 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 Babur Mandebet is, is, is uh, closed, is essentially, uh, you know, closing the Suez Canal. And closing the Suez Canal is a very big deal, as we saw with that, uh, with that tanker. Um, so all of these uh, points are what makes, uh, you know, 
giving up on Yemen uh, a problem. And also on, on, on a separate level, you know, uh, there is a moral argument to be made that, uh, you know, subjecting people in Sana'a, people under Houthi rule, to Houthi, Houthi rule is problematic. You know, after, after uh, the FTO designation was lifted, uh, the reason given by the Biden administration was that this would make it easier legally and procedurally to coordinate with the Houthis to dispense aid. I think it was a couple of months afterwards that uh, there was a Biden administration condemnation of the Houthis for misappropriating aid and selling it to fund their war efforts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, holding these two ideas uh, at once is a little bit of a problem. But I, but, I would, uh, but, sorry to interrupt. Uh, go ahead, finish your but, sentence. But, I'll, but, I'll interrupt but, you after you finish. But the, the, the true problem with, with uh, lifting the FTO designation is uh, that it sent the wrong signal inside Yemen. If you're a Yemeni living in Sana'a, and uh, you had to withstand uh, Houthi rule there. And, and it's important to understand exactly how, how brutal and how ugly that rule is. I mean, um, there are jails with thousands of women in them. They're accused of prostitution. Executions are commonplace. Um, there, I mean, in some cases, there are prisoners that are executed just because there's not enough food uh, uh, to give them. And what we saw recently, actually, uh, almost right after the, the lifting of the, the Houthi designation is that uh, a young boy, a 16-year-old boy, who was tortured to death, uh, to, tortured to, uh, to paralysis, so he couldn't walk, and he was carried into the, into the square uh, along with 12 other people, and he was executed uh, there. So, 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 you know, there is a moral imperative uh, in terms of, of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, standing in solidarity with these people that, uh, that live uh, under Houthi rule and, and, and live under Houthi rule not by choice. Um, I think what, what lifting the FTO designation has sent a signal that, you know, the U.S. is no longer, uh, uh, you know, standing with those people uh, and, you, and, and, and empowered the Houthis to continue what they were doing. Do you think it's a, do you think it's a, uh, um, it's a, uh, do you think it's a valid assumption that Houthi aspirations are um, limited to Yemen? So that if, if, if there was a total Saudi withdrawal, can the, can the Saudis have any confidence that, that, that Houthi ambitions don't extend into, in, into Saudi Arabia? Look, I think, um, I think Houthi aspirations are to a large degree limited uh, to Yemen. And when the Houthis operate outside of Yemen, it's at the behest of the Revolutionary Guards, in the same way that uh, Hezbollah operates uh, outside its borders at the behest of the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, recently, the, the Information Minister of Yemen uh, announced that in, in uh, clashes or operations uh, that were, were uh, carried out by the Yemeni armed forces, there were Lebanese and, and Iranian advisors uh, that were, were, were killed. Um, so, so theoretically, there could be a future where, where Houthi fighters are sent outside is, Yemen. But to, this, to, this, is, this is exactly how I, how, how, how I see it. Is that is that this is a this is a Yemeni Hezbollah that Iran is building, and Iran built Hezbollah in Lebanon, not simply in order to dominate Lebanon, but also they now have 150,000 rockets and missiles that are aimed at, uh, at at major strategic sites in Israel, in order to de deter Israel everywhere in its contest with uh, with with Iran, and not not just Israel. Also, I know we we know what Hezbollah has done in 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 Syria. And I, I, I lived through all these arguments when the Israelis pulled out of Lebanon in 2000. We were told by the experts, who we don't believe in, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Hezbollah was a Lebanese uh, militia, that the only reason it was fighting Israel was because Israel was on Lebanese territory. If it got off Lebanese territory, all of the conflict between Hezbollah and, and Israel would melt away, or at least Hezbollah would have no, no reason for, um, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for threatening Israel. Um, and um, none of that, in my mind, was, was a, um, none of that was a wise assumption. I think it's a much wiser assumption to look at Hezbollah as a, uh, an Iranian light infantry division on Israel's border. And it also can be used, as we've seen in the Syrian civil war, to look after Iranian interests in, uh, in, in Syria. Why shouldn't I see the Houthis as identical in the Yemen context? Right, so, I mean, I... I uh, and, I'm sorry, and, and so yeah. we're directed at Saudi Arabia. They have precision-guided yeah. weaponry, they can hit uh, Riyadh, yeah. right? 
No, I mean, there's no question that the Iranians would love for the Houthis to be exactly like Hezbollah, namely, you know, a division of the IRGC. Um, my sense is that um, I'm not sure the Houthis will behave this way. I, I suspect what the Houthis will do, in a, because there is no territorial dispute uh, uh, between the two countries. That's been resolved. I suspect what the Houthis will end up doing is, is the following. So essentially blackmailing Riyadh, saying, if you don't give us so many billions, if you don't give us money, if you don't give us oil or whatever it is that they want to further entrench themselves and consolidate their rule, we will launch drones and missiles at you under whatever pretext. That's more likely to but be so that. You're, but so you're, just to, to be clear, you're saying that my assumption that this is a, that this is a Yemeni Hezbollah is based on a, a somewhat false I think it's a bit more that complicated. That, there, that the, the IRGC has more direct control over Hezbollah than it has over the Houthis. I think, that, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, I, I, you know, for Hezbollah, for instance, to be a fighter, you have to believe in Wilayat al-Faqih. I mean, there's a doctrinal, theological, as well as organic kind of connection between Hezbollah and, and Iran. With the Houthis, is a bit more complicated. I'm not saying that it's not there. There is a connection. But it's a bit more complicated in that the Houthis themselves have their own agenda, which is not just about, I mean, in the case of Hezbollah, you know, they can use Israel, they can use the Palestinian question. There are all kinds of arguments, the Shaba farms, for instance, to maintain hostility. I think the Houthis will have to use a different set of arguments okay, to maintain I'll, that hostility. Uh, all right, I'll, uh, I, I will, um, uh, I, I will, um, alter my analogy a little bit. And I'll say the analogy is really not, not Tehran, Hezbollah, it's Tehran, Hamas. So yeah. Hamas, is a, Hamas is a somewhat independent actor. It's an independent actor of Iran, but it's got a strategic relationship. But the Iranians have also put right next to Hamas uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which yeah. they control directly. And right. that's, a way of, that's a way of keeping Hamas Honest, because they, yeah. they can, the, the Iranians can push a button and initiate conflict with Israel right. should they desire. Right. And you know, within the Houthis, you have different factions. So maybe there is a faction, in fact, that will, they'll end reach up, in. They'll create, that will end up being like the And they Islamic have a talent Jihad. for this. They did it in Iraq. They, they, create, they, they create little splinter groups and the, the, yeah. that they own. No? But, but Shouldn't I, we be worried about I, this? I, I think there's a, a, a difference between Hamas and the Houthis in that uh, the button to start a conflict with Israel is Hamas's button. Hamas lets... Iran press it when Iran wants to press it. But the button in, in Yemen uh, is, is in Iran's hand. Iran doesn't give people ballistic missiles and say, you know, this is a gift and use it. Uh, use your own judgment, please, and just don't get us in trouble. You know, they give ballistic missiles to the Houthis, they give drones to the Houthis, knowing full well that their advisors on the ground are making sure that those missiles aren't being used, uh, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, irresponsibly when they're in a showdown with Donald Trump or when they're in a showdown with the United States or when, in Vienna, when, when they're in Vienna. So there is a degree of operational control. I totally agree with Bernie, you know, uh, the, the, the Ansar Allah are not 12 Shias, they're not followers of Wilayat al Faqih uh, 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 in a theological sense, in a religious sense, maybe in a political sense. I mean, uh, the, 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 the root movement of the Houthi movement, Shabab al-Mu'min, was very much tied to the Islamic revolution, so they're politically aligned, not theologically aligned. But I think operationally, it's, it's a mistake to discount how much uh, uh, the Iranians have control, at the very least, over uh, Houthi ballistic missiles and Houthi uh, 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 drone operations. What they do on the ground, uh, maybe uh, the Iranians don't control. And there is a parallel also to Hezbollah. I mean, at the end of the day, Hezbollah is Iran's flagship proxy. It's an organ of the Revolutionary Guards to a large degree. But they do have their own interests that sometimes uh, uh, are not, uh, uh, you know, squarely within, within uh, uh, the Iranian agenda project. I, I, I think, look, I have an anecdote that I think will confirm what you're saying. Um, a couple years ago, maybe three years ago now. Tell me what I'm saying first before you. Yeah, I'm not which sure is that the, which is. is that the Houthis are basically a proxy. Uh, I mean, and, uh, of of the Iranians. I, 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 just just to be clear, my view is that it's bad to assume that they're not. Yeah. Right. Because there's a lot of people with certainty that they're not. I right. don't see any reason to have any of that certainty. So, uh, uh, three, four. I think it was it was during the Trump administration, um, the UAE sent a delegation to Iran, 
And around that time, if I was paying attention, and in fact, I heard the Iranian foreign minister, then Mr. Jawad Zarif, who uh, had visited the UN, and among the things that he you know, was saying was, wouldn't it be a terrible thing if a major tower in Dubai was hit by a Houthi missile? Oh, that would be terrible. Right? Yeah. It would be terrible. Yeah, what a shame. Yes. Yeah. It would also be... Nice little tower you got there. Yeah. yeah. And that would, of course, end the whole model of Dubai, right? In terms right. Of One drone could One drone. end the model of Dubai. Absolutely. And, and, and Iran would have plausible deniability. It would also... You know, even it was an they, errant Houthi missile. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> so, so, you know, whether he was confident that the Houthis would do this or not, in, in the effect was that it had the UAE exactly where the Iranians wanted them, and they came and uh, paid some form of obeisance. I don't have the details of what they did with the Iranians, but it was very clear that the Houthis you know, could, do, could do things for them if they wanted to. Also, when they attacked the Abqaiq and uh, Khurais fields in September of 2019, if you, if, if you listen to the Iranians then, they said, no, no, it's, it wasn't us, it was actually the Houthis. When in fact, we now know that those came launchers from, from the came, came from border. the Iraq-Iran border, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, I think we should turn to the audience soon for questions, but let's just, let, let's just have, uh, um, we, we, we dealt with, with, with two issues here. We dealt with the... The, the JCPOA negotiations is a general empowering of Iran, and then the pressure it puts on Saudi Arabia and, and Yemen. There's all, there are a lot of other areas to talk about, but let's just, looking at those two, you're sitting in Riyadh, you're watching this picture. There's no hope, you said, they think, of, of the U.S. really changing course. So what's the, what, what's the, what's the strategy? Or at least what's the, what's the plan for dealing with this multi-pronged threat to Saudi Arabia? That's a good question. I, I think it's worth noting that Saudi Arabia does have luxuries that other Arab countries don't. It's, uh, it has a large military, it has a well-equipped military uh, with large defensive capabilities, and it has uh, a financial, uh, the financial wherewithal to, 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 to decide to focus on its own economic development and to say, you know, it, it's horrible what's happening in Iraq, but, you know, we're focusing internally. The, the, which is kind of what they're doing. Which is, which is to a large degree what they and other Gulf countries are doing. But, but you know, I think the but question Muhammad, we should you can't be asking, develop You can't develop and diversify your economy if your neighborhood is course. so chaotic and constantly threatening, right? So, I mean, I, I, I appreciate yeah. that you're doing all this domestically, but it, it is, you know, the Houthis could of really course, just stabilize No, 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 it makes that much more difficult. But, but yeah. the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this is a problem for countries like Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen much more than it is a problem for Saudi Arabia. And this, this is something that needs to be talked about. You know, if we were to have, uh, you know, a realistic discussion about the future of Iraq in the short term, the medium term, the long term, you know, will the next generation of Iraqis uh, have a country that is, you know, comparable to other stable t states in the region? That's, that's when uh, you, you, you have a real problem. That's when, uh, you know, the Iranian expansion project, which is predicated on, on weak central governments, on proxy militias, on, on, on essentially using these states as, as arenas and to And using, the, the, using the violence. Using, exactly. using the, they're, they're, they're happy to destabilize exactly. if it pushes exactly. America back. Exactly. So, 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 I mean, this policy is bad for Saudi Arabia, sure, but what it does for countries like um, uh, Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and, and, uh, uh, and Yemen is, is condemn them to, to you know, unprecedented failure for, for, for a long, long time going forward. And, and you know, that's very bad for those countries. And, uh, yeah, so, what, what is your view? On, yeah, so if, if I were, you know, if I were uh, going to pretend that I'm sitting in Riyadh, I, I, what I see them doing is, is the following. First of all, there's clearly a view uh, being taken of what countries and matters really matter for Saudi Arabia's strategic interests and, and which ones don't. Clearly, Lebanon does not anymore, right? So Lebanon is really Europe's problem, it's Israel's problem, it's America's problem, it's not Saudi Arabia's problem. If Lebanon implodes, so what? From the Saudi point of view, I mean, it's sad, of course, but it's not gonna strategically affect Saudi Arabia, and that's why we see this rupture that happened. Jordan matters. So I think Jordan will always be 
uh, on Saudi Arabia's radar. Because it's a bordering state. It's a border state. It's, it's, you know, the cultures, the peoples are very important. It's very similar. Yemen matters, right? Um, internal domestic development, economic development matters. So I think you do see a kind of, and, and, and at the same time. Where's Iraq and, in this, so, in so, this uh, priority list? Let, so let, let, uh, at the same time, what you're doing is you're trying to please the American administration. So you're having discussions and negotiations with the Iranians. Though from what I hear, the Iranians don't really state what they want. They just want to have talks all the time. What they want is essentially just let's reopen embassies, but they don't want to talk about anything else. Because the Iranians want the dialogue with the Americans. They don't want the dialogue. Right. So yeah. the, but the Saudis are talking to the Iran Iranians. The Saudis you know, are desperately, frankly, trying to end the war with the Houthis and have repeatedly made offers, very generous offers to the Houthis. No interest there. Um, and, and I think the Saudis are doing this other hedging thing which with the Chinese and buying some equipment from Chinese. Um, a lot of Chinese uh, investments in big infrastructure projects. There's all of that going on. But, you know, essentially you're trying to mitigate and minimize damage from this region that is very chaotic so that you can get on with the project of building up your own society. The one other thing that the Saudis are doing, and this is where the kind of, the, you know, the, the Biden people who, who present, as Mohammed said earlier, that the region is basically forever, you know, a sectarian conflict between Shiites and Sunnis. It's true that the Iranians use sectarianism and have Shiite proxy militias working on their behalf, from Yemen to Iraq to Syria and, and Lebanon. Saudis are not interested in sectarianism. They've cut off all funding to Islamist movements. In fact, they're fighting Islamist movements everywhere in the world. They've cut off all funding to madrasas, to educational Islamic stuff. Nothing, it's all ended, mm. right? So the Saudis are now operating like a nation with national interests as a state that is not interested in Islam as a political ideology for promoting its, its, um, you know, its, its interests. That's what the Iranians do. The Saudis are not doing that. And I think that's something that, in fact, undermines the narrative that it's all about sectarianism. And two, it's a very welcome sign, because basically what America should want in the Middle East are countries that operate as states and not operate as sort of uh, Islamic internationalist militia you know, type uh, movements and you know, states that, that foment that kind of ideology and that, those kinds of operations. I don't see that having any, uh, um, uh, all, of the, all of the things that you just described, you would, it, it wasn't that long ago where I think that would have made a big impact in Washington. I don't see that moving the needle with the Biden administration. I mean, they seem to be, from my perspective, so intent on this um, dialogue accommodation with the Iranians, that, it, that anything that the allies are saying, the Israelis, the Saudis, others, aren't really, isn't, isn't really moving the needle. I just, I just throw that out as a thought. We can, we, I think we should turn to the audience now and see um, if any of you have anything that you would like to uh, say. Uh, I want to go back to the... Uh, um, I want to go back to the uh, Iran talk. Um, a while ago, the State Department issued um, a statement clarifying that the Iranians have not come with any constructive proposals in this seventh round of talk. And actually, they have not cooperated even with the IAEA. Um, and they're warning some kind of crisis. Um, so there's some theories out there or some premise that actually this uh, round of talks is under the new hardline government. And then they will send a delegation to Vienna, but they're not going to negotiate because they've been consistent of saying you have to lift the sanction before we can come back to the, to the uh, deal. Um, and some people believe, actually, the Iranians will send this delegation, but they're not going to do anything. And meanwhile, they're developing uh, facts on the ground that so becomes a bomb, and they will declare to the world that we have it. How plausible is this scenario? And second, when the administration and the Israelis keep saying that it never gonna allow Iran to have the bomb. Yet, the administration at least saying they shine away from a military option. The Israelis might, or they might give the green light to the Israelis to allow them to assassinate a scientist here and there, or to use cyber war. But 
Meanwhile, the Iranians are determined to go ahead with this. I don't know. I'm just throwing these ideas for you to, to let us know if this is really a plausible scenario. So I think that's an excellent question. Thank you, Nadia. Um, uh, you know, I think the Iranians think that their assessment of, of where the U.S. position is uh, is that America is uh, has an ironclad commitment to achieving a deal. That you know, there there is no other option for the Americans. Whether that's true or not, I, I think that's that's not far from the truth. I don't think it's 100% true. Hopefully not, but but that's what the Iranians think. I think I think that's what describes their posture in these talks. On the American side, I think that the assessment of the Iranians is that these are hardliners, and they're less easy to deal with than Jawad Darif, and we just have to work on these negotiations a little bit uh, uh, harder. I don't think that this this um, uh, difference between hardliners and moderates really exists. Uh, Khamenei's hold on power is, 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 is strong. I mean, he decides what the foreign policy of the country is, whether he chooses uh, Qasem Soleimani-like figures to deliver a message or whether he chooses Jawad Darif-like uh, uh, figures to deliver a message is purely that. It's a choice that he makes. Uh, so I think that's the misperception mis uh, uh, on, on, on both sides. I don't know if it's a misperception on the Iranian side, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that on the American side, the idea that this is you know, just a hardline government and, and, and we need to work extra hard in Vienna to reach a deal with them. And that, that's, I don't think that's how, how the dynamic is playing out. I mean, my only sense is that what the, I mean, we're already talking about not the, you know, not the removal of all the sanctions, but just some of the sanctions could be tweaked. And that's probably what the Iranians want to do. They want to, they're driving a wedge in, 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 in that direction. They want some relief. And then once that happens, then the next time round, you can justify more and more and more. And that's what I suspect is their strategy. And, I, and, and my suspicion is that it'll work with this administration. So that this is what, what Mark Dubowitz from FTD calls less for more, that, that uh, you know, the US will be getting less and then giving more. But, then, but, but yeah, it'll you, you seem know, like it's a deal. Exactly. So it's, it's little piece. But it's also important to consider that this is a deal that will expire in 2031. This is a path to give Iran open in 2031. So, you know, this conversation is one that we could have more credibly had seven years ago in 2015. But today, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the right conversation to be having. Mm. First, I have a comment and then a question. I'm really surprised. Mike and uh, Mohammed, the, the way you uh, the way you describe the Houthis as a, a proxy of the Iranian regime and the, uh, the describe that the, the Iranians have their finger on the Houthi button. I mean, isn't this discounting the importance of the very prominent, well-known Houthi rocket scientist community <laughs> and the very well-established Houthi aeronautical engineering industry? I mean. You know, couldn't that be the reason <laughs> these missiles are coming out of uh, out of Yemen? On, on, okay, separately, uh, Supreme Leader is 82. It's an Iranian system that hasn't really had a transition of power before because it was a different system the last time that happened. This guy's been the dictator of Iran for 33 years, purged all opposition, but... And so what we're seeing is his regional strategy, his grand strategy, his regional national security strategy uh, from Riyadh. But the, the discussion that I'm, I'm hearing coming from you, the points from Mohammed and, and Bernie, is as though this is an Iranian regime that is going to be there. It's going to be there as it is for the foreseeable future. Is that truly the view from Riyadh, or is there? Can they can they look three, five, seven, ten years down the road, if that long, uh, and see a succession potential succession crisis that might change the configuration in Tehran, that might change somehow, uh, for good or ill, um, Iranian regional strategy. Mohammed, you want to? I, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I can't speak speak for how how the Saudis see the the in, the inside of the regime in Iran, but from the discussions that I've had and some of the things that I've read, including, for instance, they have a a center called Rasana, which is a center that focuses on on Iran, and so it's the, 
it's it's really as close a, an insight into how Saudis think of Iran as as you can get. Um, the feeling, it's a very very good center. It is a good center. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 view from there is a that the supreme leader will will end up anointing or appointing someone who is very much in his uh, you know who shares his worldview and shares his his strategy and or uh, the IRGC will eventually take over and it'll become a sort of like a military a military style regime with a supreme leader who basically answers to this to the IRGC um, so in either case it's not likely that the regime will in any way soften if anything it'll harden and continue uh, in, in in the existing with the existing policies so I, I don't think that the the Saudis think that um, either the regime will collapse or that it'll moderate mm. for us yes Thank you all for a very interesting discussion. We kind of tiptoed around the idea of, of the similarities between what Saudi Arabia is facing and what Israel is facing, but we really didn't get into the Abrahamic Accords and sort of some of the changes that might be taking place, at least behind the scenes, between the Saudi calculus and Israeli calculus and how might that bring them together. Certainly there are many in these this town who believe that one, one externality of American retrenchment in the region is forcing the allies or compelling the allies to work more closely together. Now, I visit Saudi often, and the, the last time I was there, I did notice that um, a change of tone, a more forward-leaning Saudi posture when the question of Israel came up. I'm interested in hearing more about sort of the cost-benefit analysis in Riyadh about a strategic relationship with Israel. Um, can Israel really come to the aid of Saudi Arabia and help, at least maybe at an intelligence level, at a security level, air defense system, how much does that count versus the political cost of openly associating with Israel? We all know that Saudi Arabia is a, you know, a leader in the world of Islam, certainly amongst the Arabs, the population, although many young, but still conservative, at least when it comes to this issue. So I'm interested in your thinking about the cost-benefit analysis of, of a more forward-leaning Saudi Arabia in terms of the Abrahamic Accords. Great question. Thank you. Mohammed, you want to start? Um, I think that's a good question. I think it's no secret that there are considerable alignments and interests between uh, Israel and not just Saudi Arabia, but even other Gulf states uh, when, and in terms of how they look at the region's security. Um, uh, and it's also no secret that, uh, you know, probably Tel Aviv does not consider Riyadh to be one of its top 20 or even 30 national security threats today, and, and the same can be said about the Saudis. Uh, but uh, And also, it's important to note that Saudi Arabia did not oppose uh, the signing of the Abraham Accords with, with countries like the UAE, with Bahrain, uh, with Morocco, um, uh, and said that this is a sovereign matter, and each state uh, you know, makes their own calculations based on their assessments of their own sovereign in interests. Uh, but then that takes us to the point that you mentioned. There is a cost-benefit analysis here. And, and um, uh, the reality is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Saudi's historic uh, uh, commitment to the Palestinian cause and its, uh, and its position uh, in the region uh, uh, causes it to require, uh, uh, you know, considerable significant headway on the Palestinian issue, and they've said exactly that. They said they're totally open to, to normalizing relations with Israel, to, to stepping up, uh, cooperation with Israel, uh, but there has to be uh, an independent uh, Palestinian state. Yeah, I mean, um, so my, my my sense of um, of Saudi Arabia on Israel is that I, I do think there's a genuine difference between uh, King Salman's view on this and uh, and uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's view on this. So I think King Salman is very much of the generation that uh, feel strongly about, um, um, you know, Palestinian rights and, and also, to some extent, the illegitimacy of Israel. I mean, he's, he's very much part of that generation. I, I think someone like Mohammed bin Salman is much more attuned to his population and how his people feel. You have to remember that 70% of the, of the Saudi, of Saudi citizens are under the age of 30. Um, I'm not sure how these youngsters feel about Israel. I suspect that um, many of them really 
the, the Palestinian issue doesn't resonate as much with them as the older generation does. And so this is all to say that <clears throat> eventually uh, the regime will, be, will have a reading of its own people and will be responsive to that reading if the sense that comes from below is that it's unacceptable. Um, it, we won't see uh, Saudi Arabia joining the Abra Abraham Accords. If it's, it's not politically problematic, then we're likely to see a move in that direction. But having said all of that, you can have lots of um, benefits without actually having ever formal diplomatic relations with Israel. Like, for instance, there can be security uh, arrangements, um, you know, uh, intelligence sharing, El Alf, has overflight now over Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think you can have technology transfers, even perhaps certain coordination with military. Um, and, and the high-tech industry, for instance, I think there, there, are, uh, there are developments in this direction. But an open, formal um, uh, recognition without, as Muhammad says, you know, genuine, real kind of steps towards the Palestinians and their rights, it, I, I find very hard to imagine. I, I, I have some views on this I'm going to express, even though I'm just the moderator here. I think if you, if you look at it from the point of view of the issues that we're talking about here, the, the, the Iranian nuclear program and the Iranian position in, in, in Yemen, the opportunities for cooperation, cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Israel that is really going to change the balance with Iran are not that great. Um, so you can imagine in, in intelligence sharing, sending the same message, coordinating messages to Washington and to the Europeans, to others, um, any number of ways in which they can cooperate. But when it comes to the question, are the Israelis going to commit troops to Yemen to help the, the, the Saudis in Yemen? I can't see that. Um, um, is uh, is Israel going to attack the Iranian nuclear, um, uh, the Iranian nuclear sites and not sabotage like we saw under the, the Trump administration, but actually attack? I don't believe they will if it means going against the, the Biden administration and, 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 um, and uh, um, uh, calling down on them the, the, the wrath of the Biden administration for foiling the effort of the Biden administration to find an accommodation with Iran. And I can't imagine, let, let's just say that that did happen. A lot of people believe it will happen. Um, I'm, I'm more skeptical for the reason I just said. But let's just say it did happen. Does Saudi Arabia want to be part of that operation? I, I, I don't think so, because, it, because it, it would be sucking itself into a major war with it. could be potentially sucking itself into a major war with Iran against the will of the Biden administration. So it's already lived through what it's like to, to, to fight a war without the support of the, uh, of the Americans in, in Yemen. It's going to want to start this other war. I, I don't see that happening. So even if it is pushing them together in certain ways that are not in, insignificant, I don't see it turning into operational cooperation on the issues that, that, that we've, been, uh, we've been talking about. Ambassador. Um. You gave me away, Mike. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> there are many ambassadors in town. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, th uh, thank you for organizing this, and thank you to Mohammed and, and Bernard for, uh, for sharing your perspectives with us. I, I did want to make one comment and, and to go back on, on the issue of the uh, FTO designation for the Houthis. Uh, and, and just to, to kind of clarify a little bit, I think, what the background was, uh, and, and truth in advertising, I was one of the signatories of a letter uh, that about 100 former officials sent to Mike Pompeo before he made the decision, asking him not to do it. And uh, the reason was not because uh, any of us have any particular sympathy or, or respect for the Houthis. It had nothing to do with them. Uh, it did have to do with the fact that the entire international community, including the United Nations, World Food Program, World Health Organization, international NGOs, and everyone else were extremely concerned about the impact that this designation would have on their ability to continue to operate 
in areas that are under Houthi control, and keeping in mind that about 70 percent of the Yemeni population lives in areas that are under Houthi control. Uh, and, and not only in terms of the delivery of humanitarian assistance, but even beyond that, even the continuation of commercial relations, keeping in mind that most of the food, most of the other supplies that come into Yemen come in through commercial channels. And if banks are unwilling to extend uh, uh, letters of credit or any other uh, kinds of, of financial um, uh, financial guarantees, then you can't have that kind of commercial tra uh, traffic. So all of those arguments were the arguments that were made. The reality was that if the Trump administration had been serious about wanting to designate the Houthis, they could have done it in 2017, they could have done it in 2018, they could have done it in 2019, they didn't. They waited until December 2020, after they lost the election and when they had one foot out the door, knowing that the incoming administration disagreed with them about, about this decision. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the conclusion can only be, frankly, that the decision to designate was not because of any deep concern about the Houthis. It was, in fact, a poison pill that they were leaving for the incoming administration. Biden really didn't have much choice except to, to, um, to remove the designation, which he did, and the result has been what we've seen. And, and you know, the, the, uh, the points that you made about the FTO and about how it has um, uh, been interpreted or misinterpreted by the Houthis, et cetera, et cetera, are exactly right. Um, that's exactly what did happen. Uh, the, uh, the, the genesis of that, the, 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 the root cause of that, is not Biden's decision. It was, it was the Trump administration's decision to do this in the first place. Uh, and so I, I did want to make you know, that, that, um, that point. The question that I have is entirely different, and I think it goes back to uh, the original question. And that was, uh, we've just uh, completed the last round of JCPOA negotiations. Uh, the, what, the, what is coming out, the reporting that's coming out of Vienna, is that once again, the, they made no headway, uh, that, the, uh, that the Iranians have increased their demands uh, for sanctions relief and in, uh, in, in reverse have offered even less in terms of what they're willing to do on the nuclear file. I agree with your, your point that, that coming in um, to uh, this year and, and how the Iranians perceive the Biden administration, uh, that their expectation, not unreasonably, was that the administration would be deeply committed to getting a deal. The reality has been somewhat different. The reality has been that the Biden administration has been a tougher negotiator with them than they anticipated, and that, in fact, the Biden administration at least has appeared to be willing to walk away with no deal. Uh, and so my question to you is, if there is at least a 50-50 chance that this um, negotiation will end without an agreement, where do you think and how do you think that the region will interpret that? What will that um, suggest to them in terms of U.S position, does that bring them closer to the United States? Does it, um, does it mean that, uh, that, for example, they look to the United States and maybe by extension Israel uh, for greater security cooperation and a deeper military relationship, keeping in mind that at least the Emiratis in the past have thrown out this idea of actually trying to achieve a NATO-like security guarantee from the United States, which isn't, it's, it's not practical in the U.S. political situation, but nevertheless, they've, they've uh, put that out as a possibility. So do they, do they come back to that? Or conversely, do they see this as a requirement for them to perhaps find their own way to reduce tensions with Iran and, uh, and try to isolate uh, regional interests from what's happening in the larger international context of JCPOA and the nuclear file. 
Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, that's 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 a that's a big question. Um, I think the, 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 the issue here at its core is one um, where uh, Gulf states are in front of two very difficult choices. If, uh, uh, the, and before I say this, just to, to make a comment on, on the Biden administration's position right now. The position is very clear. Let's just go back to the JCPOA as it is exactly, but the Iranians have to walk back from everything that, that they did recently. That's, that's the deal. And for the Iranians, it's an excellent deal. They're playing hardball because Again, they think that the Americans are committed. They're not leaving the room without a deal. And if your, your adversary is not leaving the room without a deal, why not get a better one? Uh, so, so they can choose to stop this as soon as they feel that they're pressured. They're too pressured. You know, they, they'll, they'll, they'll accept. They'll walk back and they'll go back to the JCPOA. They want sanctions to be lifted first. They're trying to maximize their position. But for, for the Gulf states, I think, you know, you're, you're between a, a, a rock and a hard place. If these uh, uh, negotiations fail, then uh, you know the risk of, of, of uh, military escalation in the region rises, uh, and um, uh, you have a security uh, problem and, and a potential nuclear bomb that the Iranians have. But if this deal goes through, then you know for sure that you'll have one in 2031. But you'll also know that up until 2031, you're going to have uh, an IRGC that has the financial uh, uh, power to double down on its regional proxy network, knowing full well that this is one of the major sources of Iranian leverage alongside uh, the threat of acquiring a nuclear, nuclear weapon. There are no good options. Uh, and that's why I think there was a lot of support uh, for the idea of maximum pressure uh, on the Iranian regime. Because, because uh, you know, while in, in Europe, perhaps, or, or in Washington, it's viewed as a tactic or, or a tool to get Iran to the negotiating table, uh, for, for actors in the region, including Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, it had an intrinsic value. I mean, it deprived the regime of the resources it needs to, to, to fund the cells that attack uh, these countries. So, so there's, there's no real good answer, uh, I think. But, but um, uh, you know, one of the main flaws of this deal is that, is that it gives Iran a clear path to a nuclear bomb. Uh, it's, it's just telling Iran, wait, and while you wait, we'll pay you handsomely. Yeah, my sense is that they would be very surprised. The regional uh, players would be very surprised if the Biden administration actually says no deal at all. Um, and m my suspicion, if if that hypothetical in that hypothetical situation, I think there will be renewed uh, respect for the administration. That you know, this is uh, an administration that's not simply transactional, but that has some spine and principles. And um, and they will certainly, you know, try to think of how to then protect themselves from uh, from Iran that may or may not become more aggressive. I mean, I, I think a, a no-deal a no, no outcome doesn't necessarily mean a more aggressive Iran. Um, it might, in fact, mean a, 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 you know, a, a, an Iran that is um, perhaps less, a, less aggressive. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm once again going to give my view on this, Please. Uh, which is that I, I dispute the premise that the that the Biden administration is being a tougher negotiator than anyone. Um, that, that the absence of a deal means the Biden administration is being a tougher negotiator, because there's been an enormous amount of um, unofficial sanctions relief yeah. that they've been um, uh, that they have been um, giving in the form of actually releasing money, but also then not enforcing uh, other sanctions. I mean, Chinese, Iranian. The Chinese purchases of Iranian oil are through the roof. The United States isn't trying to do anything to stop that. So uh, uh, um, I think the if if the deal ends, I mean, if the, if the negotiations end and the Americans say we have no choice but to put uh, very, very significant financial pressure on, on the Iranians, that's one thing. But if it ends and there's this informal... Um, there's this informal sanctions relief. From an Iranian point of view, that's as good as the deal. And, 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 and that's, what I, yep. that's where I think we're headed. We're not headed, we're headed to, we're headed to no deal, which means there's a, there's a quiet understanding that you will keep your, you, Iran, will keep your, your uh, stockpiles at level X and we, will, and, 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 and we won't touch 
any of your trade with China or with this actor or, 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 or with that actor. It's a kind of unofficial J, uh, JCPOA where the Iranians always have the, um, the, the leverage over, um, uh, over us. That allows the Biden administration to then go around and say in Congress, well, you know, we didn't lift the sanctions. No, formally you didn't, but in practice you, you did. <laughs> No. I've been watching this issue for a long time. Uh, okay, I think uh, I think we'll stop there. Thank you uh, for what's been a really thank you too uh, for what's been a, a, a very interesting, engaging conversation. And thanks uh, to all of you for your uh, for your questions and your uh, and and your and your comments. Um, and without uh, further ado, say goodbye. Thank you.